All right, well, it's 105. We're going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today for another uh, Chamber Thursday Roundtable. I'm Alfred Sanchez. I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Miami Chamber. And, you know, throughout this COVID-19 crisis, we've been focusing on health and business issues. But now that we've, you know, opened up our communities and our businesses are slowly coming back online, we wanted to take a look at our legal system and how it how it's coping with the, you know, as the mayor calls it, the new normal. So make no mistake, in the wake of this pandemic, there has been an indelible mark left on how we run our judicial system. It's gonna impact everyone and every company that's seeking their day in court from traffic tickets to corporate lawsuits. So it's important that we really understand. To help us get a clearer picture of those changes and to discuss the implications, we have a panel of top professionals in the legal field. We have with us the Honorable Catherine Fernandez Rundle, Miami-Dade State Attorney, uh, Albert Dotson Jr. Many of us know him as a great partner and member of the chamber and managing partner of Bills and Sumberg. The Honorable Ariana Fajardo Oshan, Oshan, the U.S. State Attorney for the Southern District of Florida. Uh, Wilfredo Ferrer, who's a partner, senior partner at Holland and Knight and the Honorable Bertila Soto, the Chief Judge of the 11th Judicial Circuit of, uh, of Florida. Uh, moderating, uh, moderating our discussion today is a good friend of uh, Miami, a good friend of ours, uh, the Honorable Steve Leifman, Judge of the 11th Judicial Circuit Court of Florida. Now, as always, an important part of our program is hearing your questions. Uh, and so we wanna leave time at the end of the moderated discussion for just that. So in order to have an efficient use of that time and be able to get through as many questions as we can, let me go over some house rules. First of all, uh, aside from our presenters, everyone is going to be on mute throughout the conversation. To submit a question at the bottom center, there is a Q&A tab. Uh, open that up and submit your questions there to the speakers in writing. Only those questions in the Q&A section are going to be floated up to the speakers. They're going to be done. That's going to be done by our staff at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, for general comments and for quick clarifications or just to communicate with one another, feel free to use the chat function uh, that we've left open for you for just that. Also, make sure that you keep an eye on that chat link because uh, that chat area because links to uh, uh, many of the information or uh, other important uh, documents are going to be placed there by our staff and by our panelists. So watch out for there for any uh, important links. And finally, the session is being recorded, and a link to that session uh, that recording is going to be posted on the chamber website later today. And I'm going to ask the staff to put our chamber website www.miamichamber.com in the chat uh, for you now. Okay, so let's begin our program and let me introduce my good friend uh, and really who I think is a great visionary leader in our legal system, the Honorable Steve Leifman. Uh, judge Leifman is an administrative judge for the 11th Circuit Court of Florida, as I said, and many of us know him from his incredible work on the Criminal Mental Health Project. He's been trying to ensure that the mentally ill do not end up in prisons, that, that uh, jail isn't the alternative for, for mental health. Um, that has led to some incredible groundbreaking work. Last year, he broke ground literally on the Miami Center for Mental Health and Recovery, which um, will hopefully open up in the very near future. Uh, we're very lucky to have him. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alfred, and thank you so much to the Chamber uh, for putting together this really important event. Um, we're very, very appreciative. Uh, before we get into the uh, formal remarks and questions, um, I did want to let all of you know that uh, Judge Soto and Al Dotson are going to have to uh, get off a little bit early. So if you have a specific question for them, uh, go ahead and enter it onto the chat so I can make sure that we get it to them before they uh, have to take off. So, you know, we've all heard that uh, wonderful expression. We probably all have overused that expression that we are living in unprecedented times. Well, this time we are really living in unprecedented times. We are dealing with a once in a century pandemic. We are dealing with very serious and grave economic challenges. And we are dealing with very serious social and racial strife all at once. 
And it's critical, particularly in times like this, that we have an open and accessible judicial system. So we understand that civil societies, in order to resolve their disputes, have a place to go, where people feel that they are being heard, that our system is independent and just. And when we're unable to do that, it can cause a lot of problems. And so we deal with everything in the criminal, I mean, in the civil and in, in criminal system. Uh, everything from resolving our civil disputes, to settling states, divorces, complex business litigation, domestic violence, traffic, criminal, you name it, we do it. Baker Acts, Marchman Acts, all of those very critical uh, functions in a society have to go through a court system. And we've never dealt with anything like this. And uh, we're just very fortunate today um, because we could not have a, a better uh, group of individuals to talk about it. Uh, all of these individuals are both public servants and champions in our community. Um, you know them all, Alfred uh, introduced them all to you, but we really don't have to introduce them because we know from the great work that all of them have done over the years, uh, how important they are to our community. So I wanted to start um, with Judge Soto um, to give us a kind of an overview of where the courts are today, uh, how we have been responding to the uh, pandemic um, and some of these other issues and, and how people can access the court. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I want to uh, thank the chamber for putting this on and welcome everyone to, to the um, webinar. Uh, we are currently in phase two under the Supreme Court order. We started June 15th into phase two, which means that we are having very limited in-person contact in our courthouses, but are having some public coming in, for example, for fingerprinting. Very limited, by appointment only, only when a judge um, requests them to come in. And when someone comes into any of our 11 courthouses, you must be wearing a mask with no exceptions. All judges and staff will be wearing masks. When you come in, you will have a health screening and your temperature will be taken and questions with reference to your health and COVID um, will be heard. If you, if you have a temperature of 100.4 or over, or you have any significant um, symptoms, we will ask you to go ahead and leave and reset your case and let the judge that was expecting you, um, that, you that you're gonna reset your case. But the bottom line is, is we are working since March 30th when we got our Zoom licenses purely remotely. We are hearing every type of case throughout every division with the exception of jury trials remotely. And I'm happy to say that Miami-Dade was selected by the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Florida to participate in a pilot project where we're hoping to have our first civil jury trial with a hybrid of both remote jury selection and live jury trial in July, if the science and the health of Miami-Dade continues to remain the same. If it upticks, that may not happen. So we are working hard to have all of you, all the businesses and all the citizens of Miami-Dade to have access to the courts. And um, if you have an issue and you have a case pending, you can call your judge's office they will be getting back to you if they don't answer live. They should answer live, but some of our phones cannot be um, transferred. So they have to call and get the message first. And we are open for business and here to hopefully help you in this COVID world. I believe we have a website um, that we can put up and we'll show you or put in your chat in case uh, you need to get more information. You can always go on. Um, but most of the judicial assistants, I believe, are answering phones and have access to the judges. So, you know, from your perspective, people should think of us as operating normally uh, at this point. Yes. Um, and, I, and I believe every system is working. We're even doing traffic tickets uh, by re remote Zoom. We're, uh, we, we were part of the online dispute resolution pilot project that the Supreme Court had put out, and we are actually, and, and, and Steve is integral to that, doing online dispute resolution for non-criminal traffic. In addition, our traffic hearing officers are hearing traffic tickets by Zoom. 
Um, we are moving forward with everything we possibly can to give access to the public to get their, their disputes resolved. And obviously it's all being done either remotely or with health screening and social distancing and PPE, uh, personal protective equipment in mind. Thank you. Ariana, I wanted to turn to you for a minute and thank you again for joining us. And maybe you can give us an overview of what's going on in the federal system. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you all for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon. I wish that I could update you and say the federal system was as far along as our state court system, but it's not quite that way. Under the CARES Act, our uh, judges are able to do more virtual hearings and we're given that authority to do so. So we have seen hearings continued to happen. However, um, it's different. Each judge has a different uh, policy. Some of our judges are doing in-court hearings. Some of them are doing virtual hearings. Some of them require PPE. Some of them do not require PPE. So you really have to call the federal judge ahead of time to see what they require. We do not have jury trials going on in federal court, whether it's civil or criminal. There is a stay on all jury trials until August 31st at this time. There is also a stay on all grand juries until August 31st at this time. So cases are not being indicted um, at this time. So all cases coming into the criminal justice system are coming in by way of information or a complaint uh, pending a grand jury indictment at some point in the future. So from our perspective, the federal court system, basically we're only filing cases that really are danger to the community. Um, other than that, civil cases continue to work. Uh, those have not stopped and our civil division is very active, but the court system really is broken down now into subcommittees. We're all actively trying to figure out what to do next. We are looking to our state court system to see how they progress in these virtual jury trials that they are going to be doing. Uh, but we do not have a clear path to reopening our courthouse as the state court system does at this time. Is it hindering your ability to do criminal investigations? Uh, what's going on now and how are you handling some of those issues, particularly some so of the major that? Not at all. So all federal agencies and the U.S. Attorney's Office, we continue to handle all criminal investigations. We continue to work remotely. Uh, everybody basically is, is teleworking at this time. We continue to actively work cases. We continue to actively send out subpoena and gather information and you know, uh, communicate and interview people as needed virtually. We have uh, a bunch of indictments ready to go when our grand juries come back. But like I said, if it's a fraud case, we are holding those cases back and not putting those cases into our criminal justice system at the federal level at this time because it's really not a completely functioning system and there's no reason to backlog a system at this point until we can figure out how to move it forward in a way that that makes sense for all of us because it's not just you know the U.S. Attorney's Office we need to figure out the, the judges we need to figure out uh, the defense attorneys in the system we need to work with the Bureau of Prisons because they're also impacted by whatever decisions that we make. But I would say, you know, everybody's anxious to get back uh, into business because we do have investigations that are ready to be filed and cases that are piling up on people's desks. But um, just because the cases aren't filed doesn't mean the work is not getting done. We are actively continuing to move forward. If attorneys needed to reach um, some of your assistant U.S. attorneys, are they able to just call the office and get through or how does that work? Absolutely. So we have transferred phones to cell phones. Every, all the AUSAs have their phones, their office lines transferred to the cell phones. All assistant United States attorneys have cell phones. Those are published um, and they're required to answer them. And if they're not, then I need to know about that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, I'm going to go to you for a minute if uh, we can, and I wanted to talk about um, how this is impacting 
uh, some of the state offenses that we see and uh, your office and your ability to respond to um, the issues that are going on. Thank you, Steve. Uh, really appreciate being part of this panel. And it's so good to see that our business partners in the community really care about what's going on in the judicial system. And my hat is off to our Chief Judge Bertie Soto because I'm just dealing with criminal justice issues and she has such a broader base that she's doing a fantastic job. So, Steve, no one could really reframe better than what you did at the onset about what a challenge this has been. And it's really caused all of us um, to be very innovative. And for our office, it's been very challenging because we have our public safety responsibilities. And at the same time, we have to comport to what the courts are doing or not able to do. But be that as it may, a couple of good things came into play. One is we're used to crisis usually because of hurricanes. So we've always had in place a crisis preparedness team and plans and how we were gonna do it and execute it. So that was helpful because we were able to put that into place almost immediately. And the other thing is that I think is important for our business community. We are very collaborative. We're one, I always say when I go outside of our community, anywhere in the country and in the state, our, the, the day county community, every one of the stakeholders, the courts, the public defender's office, the clerks, the jails, our administrative judges, we're all collaborating. And that's what made this really proceed rather seamlessly. But let me tell you a little bit about our office. We're now mission critical. We had nine buildings and 1,200 employees we had to send home and, and have them begin working remotely. And we did that. Almost all of our, all of our filing of cases, for those that don't know, and there's an arrest for the majority of cases, we have to review all those, meet with civilian witnesses, meet with police witnesses, gather the, the information, the documentation. That all, all used to be done by paper. That's about 18,000 cases a year just coming in. We went completely paperless, and we are now doing all of that by e-filing. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is we needed to get um, remote, you know, get the phone calls all rolled over, right, to all those employees that we sent home, and they are working, but just not, they're working remotely. And we took something like 117 laptops and gave it to the administrative courts so that the courts would have, that they needed to go virtual, uh, we also sent, I think, 135 cameras with the laptops. We sent about 35 to the Department of Corrections just so we could all connect virtually. And just to give you an example, just a volume, in, in just the, if you think about just from the last 30 days, uh, we've had team meetings of 1,000, over 1,200 of those with over 4,300 participants. We've had 25,000 one-to-one uh, -one phone calls, and we've done just under 1,700 life-size meetings and uh, 4,000 participants at any given time. The other thing that we have open and running, so we continue to file cases, we also have our Child Support Enforcement Division. That accounts for about 80,000 cases. I know there are a lot of families that were concerned what was going to happen to their case. So we have 25 individuals that just hand answer those calls coming in every day and they're just amazing since we went COVID and shut down in mid-march as through last friday they have handled over 33,000 phone calls of people wanting to know what's going on with their cases as judge birdie soda said we are open we are we're doing hearings we're doing first appearance meetings so when someone gets arrested there's a bond hearing that's taking place um, any emergency motions are on calendar. We just opened three courtrooms virtually in the felony divisions, and we're going to be going all courtrooms come July 6th. We'll be virtual courtrooms. We'll be able to handle cases that way. Um, in the misdemeanor, which the county court cases, uh, we've got all of those courts, Steve, you, you, that's your stopping ground. They're all up and running, all seven of them at this time. So that's the good news in terms of working with the defense bar and the public defender and the clerks and the courts. We are open and functioning, not fully, of course, and one of the issues that uh, Judge Soto talked about is jury trials. 
because I, as I understand from the civil arena, it's the same thing in the criminal division. Jury trials are what drive people to want to close cases. So we're all concerned, uh, all of us, the courts, the defense, the prosecution, and without jury trials, it, we won't be incentivized to really get cases closed. So they're stockpiling now and you know, we're waiting for the next wave when we open up. Um, I also want to tell you, if I may, I don't have much time, I don't want to take too much of everybody's time, but I do want to share with you a couple of concerns we have that maybe the public needs to be aware of. And it deals with domestic violence, family violence issues. So there's two concerns there. One is we know when there's a crisis, um, oh, I was gonna tell you about overall arrest. Okay, I moved on. Um, you wanna go back to that, Stephanie, the first chart. I was gonna to talk to you about arrests. So this will show you more or less where we were before COVID. And you can see there in March, and then you can see when March 15th hit, and we basically closed, arrest really dropped significantly. And there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. But that at least allowed us to sort of grapple uh, with managing the jail population, managing bond hearings. So there were fewer arrests, and a lot of that had to do with officers using a civil citation process, as opposed to actually making arrests and transporting them down to the jail. You will see, however, something that we're gonna start to be concerned about a little bit. You can see there's an increase around May 17th, and you can't see the full chart there, at least I can't on my screen, maybe you can. We're a little worried about an uptick, and we're noticing that some of those are armed robberies, and for those of you who don't know, armed robberies are very serious. So we're getting ready, we're watching that like a hawk, just to make sure we're on top of those cases. Then to go to the domestic violence cases, if you go to the next one, this was just to show you why we were concerned. Uh, we were concerned because at a time of crisis, our history tells us with high anxiety, families at home, staying at home, we were concerned that victims were staying at home and being trapped in abusive situations. So we started to track the arrests and you can see there that they started to decrease. I checked with the judge who's over the um, domestic violence court that does protection orders. She was concerned as well that those were down. We also knew that there was capacity in our shelters. And so we started a campaign, I think it was like two or three weeks ago, we went to the county commission and all the employers that are out there, big business, this is a message that's really important because you have families staying at home, you have children staying at home. We don't have children also going to school and having all those eyes at day camp at school at the daycare. So if there's a way to get this message out um, to all the employees and those in, in your businesses to let them know these courts are open and the domestic violence courts are open, they're issuing protection orders, the shelters are open and they're CDC compliant. Our office is filing charges on domestic violence. I think we've done just under about 3,000 uh, hearings, I mean, you know, we would call pre-files and getting those cases filed. So I wanted to make sure you all knew about that because it's something that we're watching. And I think there's a way that you can participate in this message. And then last but not least, if anyone wants any information, uh, Alfred Sanchez told us to try to let you all know where you can go to reach out and get any more information you want. We have our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, and so on and so forth. The last thing I want to say is that your state attorney's office and every, all of us in the criminal justice system, we're doing everything we can to make sure that public safety is not compromised in any way possible and that we continue to function in a fair and just way for those going through the system and for all of you in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And, and I just wanted to reiterate something that you said that um, actually for witnesses and victims, access is almost easier now because they don't have to come down to your office. And so if you are a witness or have a situation, understand they will interview by you by Zoom and uh, be able to get your information that way. And I think you even mentioned yesterday that yeah. you're getting better participation. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting you should say that, Steve, because we were talking about this preparing yesterday. And so a lot of what we had to pivot and start doing 
is actually we're probably never going to go back to a lot of the ways we were doing it before. And one of them is just what you're saying, that normally, unfortunately, we have to drop a lot of cases because victims and witnesses can't, won't participate. And now the numbers are going up in terms of the participation for the very reason you just said, that they, they like accessing us, accessing us virtually. They don't have to get daycare and they don't have to park and come down to this big system we have. So you're right, all those employees should know that if someone is called to duty to um, be a witness or a victim, there's an easier and, and, and more cost efficient way to do it. Thank you. Yeah, on a humorous side, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we will see greater participation of uh, defendants in the court system, but we've been operating uh, virtually the county traffic system. And uh, even this week, we had defendants who were charged with driving with a suspended license, <laughs> driving their car on their phone in court. On <laughs> you can't That's make great. That's a great story. So, but you know, I think we're all adjusting, uh, um, but we are getting good response and uh, people should know we are open and available. You know, so, Steve, yeah. only in our beautiful city, Magic City, Miami, would that happen, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Bertie, if I can go back to you real quick, because I know you have to leave early. We did have a question come in and I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, and if not, maybe someone else does. And the question is, are the sheriffs uh, reinforcing evictions on commercial properties yet? I don't know what the sheriffs are doing. We are hearing commercial eviction cases. It's not um, banned by the executive order. I, I, I wrote the person saying to look at the governor's executive order 2094 and the court's order, administrative orders 2010 and 2008. Uh, they are hearing evictions, but Brits of possession are not being issued, they're suspended. So it's a dichotomy. My, my suggestion is to call the judge's office if you have a case and see what you can schedule. But those are the, the administrative orders you should be looking at. Executive Order 2094, Administrative Order 2010 and 2008. And those are available on the 11th Judicial website under Administrative Orders under the COVID tab. Great, thank you so much. I wanna um, turn to Al and Willie and, and thank you both. Um, and, and we're just so pleased and appreciative of both of you being here. Um, you know, we have two managing partners. Uh, Willie is known as the executive partner, but it's virtually the, the same responsibility and, and Al Dotson and is the managing partner as well of, of his wonderful firm. And, and we appreciate your time, but we also want to, um, our listeners to get a better idea of how this is impacting uh, the civil world, how it's impacting your lawyers and, and staff. And, um, you know, I imagine a lot of them are appearing virtually as well and, and uh, we can start with uh, Al real quick if you want, and maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, background on, on what's going on in your firm and how you're dealing with the situation. Sure, happy to do so. Before I get started, I want all the members of the bar to know that before we came on, the judges said we could call them by their first name. Uh, I don't want anyone to think that I'm being disrespectful. So Steve, thank you for that question. I uh, also want to go back to uh, what uh, Alfred said as he opened up uh, today, and he talked about the mayor's comment about this being the new normal. Uh, in our firm, what I've said to uh, our people is that this is not the new normal. It's the current normal. We don't know yet what the new normal is going to look like, but it will absolutely be in part uh, informed by the innovation that you're hearing that the court system is, is taking part in. Uh, we're all learning different ways to do the same thing. And we're coming out of this uh, realizing that these new ways may actually become part of uh, the new normal. And, and when Kathy went into uh, domestic violence, and I think that was appropriate because humanity uh, can't be lost in this conversation. And as you look at where the staff and the lawyers are in our firm uh, and in others, uh, it's important that we take care of the staff. Uh, we recognize that uh, as we innovate to represent our, our clients, uh, we have to do so in a way uh, that is humane and, and maintains our humanity. So specifically, Steve, uh, what we're doing, and we too had uh, to go remote. Uh, we did see in the executive orders, probably for the first time in the history of mankind, that lawyers were considered essential uh, and our offices remained open. 
uh, that was a, that was a shock to many of us. But the offices remained open, but uh, the vast majority of our people were working uh, remotely. Uh, we did have people uh, that had never worked from home before. Uh, we we did have time to do the appropriate surveys, get the equipment, so we could um, convert over to remote service of our clients uh, nearly uh, immediately. With respect to interacting with the court system, uh, what we are seeing uh, both in federal courts here and across the country where we have cases, as well as our local courts, uh, local state courts, that courts are innovating too. Uh, they're adapting to uh, what is taking place. Uh, there, there are uh, differences in the way in which uh, each judge is requiring us to interact. However, our clients still have issues that we must resolve. The lawyers are dealing with discovery issues and, and those things that don't necessarily require uh, court involvement uh, in a way that is moving cases forward. So we are very active in, uh, in, our, in our litigation area. And then lastly, in our, I'll call it the quasi-judicial area, and that's mostly the interaction with government. Uh, government too uh, is making sure that uh, the residents of our community have access to them uh, through various means and platforms, including uh, Zoom meetings uh, that are taking place. So a lot of innovation. Uh, Kathy, I'll use your word, a lot of collaboration. Uh, and, and through both uh, those two areas, I know that we will ultimately get to the new normal that will take advantage of all the great innovation that is inherent in our business community, uh, inherent in this community as, in general, uh, to really operate more effectively and efficient efficiently uh, as a profession. Are, are you finding uh, business steady or is it dropped off or the lawyers able to bill? I mean, is it uh, economically disruptive for you or are you all finding that the specialties that you cover are, are maintaining fairly well? Uh, uh, thank you for setting me up to make sure that I tell all of my lawyers watching right now, you better be billing. Uh, <laughs> Having, having said that, what we have seen uh, is as a firm, we've been focused on making sure every area within our firm uh, has counter cyclical components of it. In other words, you're coming to the office uh, with umbrella and sunscreen at the same time. Uh, you want to be able to uh, help clients move forward when the economy is on an incline and to counsel them through whatever challenges they have as the economy is on a decline. So in each of our practice areas, uh, we, we see activity moving forward. Uh, if you spend time cross-training your, your lawyers uh, to prepare them for this moment, uh, to be good counselors of their clients, you will see uh, activity uh, continuing. So short answer is yes, activity is continuing. It's different activity. So you'll see peaks and valleys in different areas uh, of the firm, uh, but consistently uh, we're, con we're starting to see uh, a trajectory of increased activity uh, after the uh, immediate decrease. Great, thank you for that. And Willie, I'd like to turn to you and, and do some follow-up and see how uh, your firm is handling uh, these issues similarly and uh, maybe um, you know, talk about a little bit one of the questions that came in uh, why I was talking to Al and, and Al can respond to this afterwards as well is are you able to, uh, and how are you able to look for new clients during this period of time? So Willie, why don't we go to you for a minute? Sure, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's great to, to see my good friend, Al, and, and have, uh, uh, he and I are going through the same thing in our firms. It's very similar, our experiences are. So thank you, Steve, and, and for the Chamber of Commerce for having us here. Um, I think just as we heard from the courts and the government agencies, the, the private law firm, uh, industry has been upended in ways that we never would have imagined. I mean, we literally went from one day to the next over at Holland and Knight. It felt like we had 28 offices around the world and we went from 28 to 2,800 offices, you know, making sure that all of our lawyers, all of our professional staff members were connected. Thank goodness that we have the technology to be able to do it. And I think that the investment the, um, uh, in, in technology and making sure that we're efficient uh, it's actually worked. I'm actually surprised, to be honest with you, that it's worked as well as it has. Um, I, um, I, I had never done a Zoom video meeting before. 
I had never billed electronically before. I was old school, you know, looking at the paper bills and, uh, you know, sort of editing them and sending them back. So our attorneys and professional staff members had to uh, flex very different muscles and learning all of the different variations uh, and adapting to new technologies. But also one issue that we also were looking for is that now that we're dealing with clients um, virtually, um, a lot of sensitive information going through the you know, technology and through the uh, airwaves, we had to make sure that transmissions were secure. Uh, we had to make sure that you know, we took care of, um, in terms of witness preparations, it has changed the name. I mean, it's changed the whole game on how we prepare, how we work with our, our clients um, if they have a deposition, if they have to go to a hearing. Because typically when you prepare somebody, it's a very extensive and intensive process. You, you want to you know, connect with them. You need to see them. Um, you get a lot from their uh, learning from their body language and you lose a lot of that when you're doing things through a video and remotely. So we're training our attorneys on how to even just go to the, you know, how to prepare, how to, how to do this in a way where, you know, uh, if you have, we had a hearing at holiday night with the courts and, and the federal courts, and it was a um, parental kidnapping case. We had uh, a witness in Guatemala with a translator, an attorney in Miami, another one in another city in, in the United States, and knowing how to work with all of that, all the, the, the dry runs that we had to do, all the, you know, uh, how do you communicate with your witness who is in another state video and you're trying to tell them, hey, listen, wait before you answer the question. You know, typically you just raise your hand if you're next to them. Now you've got to find alternative means of communicating. So all those stresses, and this is getting back to Al's point about the humanity, we realize that um, uh, these different um, things that we have to do now to practice is stressful. Um, I think that remote, working remotely um, has eroded the line between nighttime and daytime, between weekday and weekends. Um, I think that we have to be very mindful of that. And we are continuously talking to our staff, uh, not only our staff, but our clients about you know, mental health issues and making sure that we are dealing with this new change. And like Al said, we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and how do we do this in, in, in making sure that our workforce is um, dealing with uh, anxiety issues or mental health issues, substance abuse issues that could be happening in their homes because you know, you, you are, you're stuck. But getting back to, to your final question, uh, Steve, about looking for clients. So um, luckily, and, and like Al said, there's peaks and valleys. There's pr practice areas that lend themselves much more easily uh, to finding clients, but it's really just making the extra effort of getting out there, sending your emails, sending messages to your clients about asking them, hey, we're here, how can we help you? Um, what issues are you encountering? Uh, one way that I'm looking for clients and finding clients is that, and we'll talk about this later, is that now with all the money that's being given to businesses for the stimulus projects to help them, there's a lot of fraud that's going on. So, um, so I'm, we're out there trying to um, tell the business community what they can do to prevent themselves or to protect themselves from being prosecuted. It's weird after 23 years of being a prosecutor, now being on the other side, um, you know, we, 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 we have those, we send out, we have webinars just like this um, to try to get um, the, the business community, our clients aware and know that, that the law firms, law firms are open, law firms are, are ready um, and, and that we can help them in, in the myriad of issues that, that, are, that are happening now in this, in this uh, pandemic. Um, so that's how we've been trying to do it, Steve, is being proactive, being taking the initiative, looking for needs, getting out there and making and communicating. It's all about communication um, to get to get through this. So, so Steve, I will just add to uh, my good friend Willie's comments uh, in answer to your, your question. Uh, first, he's absolutely right uh, that reaching out to people is, is important. Uh, when we first went to remote access, uh, shared with the lawyers uh, and our firm that empathy is their new currency and that they need to they need to spend it widely and deeply across the entire community and make sure to reach out to every client and every prospective client and every referral source. They just make sure people are doing okay. Um, and, and whatever condition they find themselves in, uh, you as a counselor uh, might uh, be able to provide uh, assistance. Second, uh, 
to make sure that we're producing thought leadership on issues that people are addressing for the very first time ever in their business, uh, to be in the forefront of, of sharing what information we might have uh, that could enable them to continue their business uh, as it moves forward. Third, Steve, I will tell you that I'm sure that my friend uh, Holland and I, and I uh, would say to you that everyone listening here should hire us. That's one great way to add clients. Uh, we'll be happy to send you an engagement letter. We'll put it in chat, however you want it to happen. Uh, that's another great way uh, of, of bringing new clients in. So thank you for that opportunity to advertise our two firms. My pleasure. I'm going to uh, switch back because it came up in Willie's comment to Ariana a minute about some of the concerns that uh, the federal government may have with the trillions of dollars that have been sent out to businesses and others um, if they're taking any steps now to make sure that those dollars are getting spent appropriately and uh, avoiding any kind of fraud and then helping uh, Willie's firm out by uh, indicting people, I guess. so. Uh, well, we have to investigate first, you know, we don't just indict. So we, you know, the, the monies that were sent out were done in two waves. So the first waves of money, uh, we've received the list and the second waves of money, we've received the list. We have a task force, nationwide task force that is very involved in this. One of the prosecutors in my office, a very experienced um, prosecutor in my office, Michael Berger, has been tasked with um, this particular project. He has the list. He's been working with uh, the FBI on this and uh, reviewing everybody who's received the money and making sure that the money has been used appropriately. So it is a big task and uh, it will take some time, but uh, he is a very aggressive, fair prosecutor but if it's not being done correctly and the money's not being used correctly, I promise you he's going to find out and um, he'll come after you. So it behooves you to follow the rules and the instructions given by the federal government on how that money should be used. So it's not, you know, to pay your boating and all of your personal expenses. It really needs to go to pay those salaries and your business operations. Um, so you need to keep copious records of how that money is being spent uh, because it is going to be monitored and it is going to be looked at. And um, my prosecutors, um, this is, uh, he kind of does this 24 seven, you know, as much as I talk to him about mental health and taking a break and, you know, going on vacation and doing something else, uh, he lives for this. So. Uh, you know, I, uh, I know the right guy is in charge. If there's fraud, he's going to find it. And he's going to keep everybody busy, both Al and Willie's guys. <laughs> on, and I, okay. on a quick follow-up to that, you know, sadly, Miami has been known as one of the hotspots for Medicare fraud for decades, uh, international and locally. Have you seen an uptick during this period? Is it stable? And, and are you able to continue to monitor as you were before? So we have, um, you know, like everything else, it continues to be a hotspot. So when they started this task force, of course, the first thing that happened was PPE started to appear here and it was being sold to the government. Um, for example, you know, to places where it was needed like New York for an extraordinary amount of money. So right away, it was just, we were getting all of the, you know, information, all of the leads down here. So I can tell you that our economic fraud section has not had any rest. Um, they have, they are ready to go with so many indictments, you know, so a lot of the stuff we've been able to run some interference on and be able to correct you know, to just save uh, innocent buyers from overpaying, you know, particularly government agencies, which is what some of the businesses down here were trying to exploit. Um, but it's, it's continued to be the same. It's just instead of healthcare fraud lately, it's been, you know, PPE fraud and stuff of that nature. But it continues, you know, to be the fraud capital of the world, unfortunately. And if I may, Steve, uh, backing up on exactly what Ariana is saying is that we've seen this uh, throughout many uh, different 
events in history where there's a lot of money that gets doled out, there's always going to be an opportunity for fraud. So now that I'm a defense attorney, we, we tell our clients to make sure exactly what Adriana said. I think the key thing here is a lot of these programs get uh, rolled out very quickly. And sometimes the regulations could be confusing. You're asking uh, businesses to certify immediately whether they are eligible. The, the advice here is make sure that you are documenting your interpretations of why you're accepting the money and how you're using it. Maybe have a separate account. Make sure your internal controls are strong. Your compliance programs, fix, fixating on expenses. Your compliance program on January 1 of 2020 should be very different from your compliance program in May of 2020 for all these reasons. You wanna make sure that, that any, any doubt later on, because these cases, Ariana will tell you, they take time. And a year from now is when you may be getting a knock on the door by the government. And if you don't have that sort of documentation, that record of not only how you spent the money, but how did you interpret that regulation speaking to your attorneys? And for hospitals, for any of our uh, listeners that are in the medical field, um, I wouldn't be surprised if later on in years to come, um, the department will look back and see how did the hospitals behave during this COVID? You know, now that elective surgeries were no longer being used, were, were there upticks in um, pricing, in expenses, in charging uh, patients for, for care? These are all the things that we gotta be very, very mindful, thinking 10 steps ahead because these investigations are lengthy and they take time. So, you know, you may not hear about them immediately. Thank you. And I can just add one more thing. The best defense is a good offense, right? Um, compliance, compliance, compliance. When we come knocking on the door and we see good compliance programs, that is one thing that the government really takes into consideration. Thank you. Uh, Judge Soto, uh, uh, before you take off, we had a, a question uh, come in. Uh, if you could talk a little bit more, more how you see these virtual jury trials working. Well, first of all, there are no, there, there are no virtual trials in the state of Florida, unless you're part of the five pilot project um, cases that are gonna be heard before October of this year. The Supreme Court in their last AO said that nothing can done remotely in a jury trial unless you're part of the pilot project. So once the reports for the pilot projects come in, they will decide whether it's a hybrid, whether it's partially by Zoom and then the jury is brought in, or if it's all by Zoom, like we saw in Texas, uh, it really we really don't know. It's a moving target. It's going to be based on the pilots. There are um, the only trials we can have after 30 days of being in phase two will have to be in-person jury trials, if we do that at all. And we don't feel that the the health of our residents um, could withstand opening the courthouses to have jury trials at this time, so we won't be doing that. But we, we don't know what remote jury trials are gonna be until the pilot projects come in and the Supreme Court looks at the results of what's been done throughout the state. You have any idea when you think that might start? The, re, the jury pilots? Yes. Uh, ours is due, we hope will be heard starting on July 15th. We just are afraid because of the uptick, whether or not we're gonna bring in the jurors for the second half. So we don't know. And I think that that's probably, I would say any between July and August throughout the state. So well, there was a fascinating article in the New York Times this week uh, about a couple of the communities that have actually tried jury trials and witnesses have had masks on. And a lot of issues arose that none of us had ever contemplated uh, Sixth Amendment, you know, rights in terms of uh, cross-examination and, 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 you know, not being able, Willie kind of touched upon it a little bit, but not being able to watch responses from witnesses and get a better feel from jurors, how they may be reacting to your questions and jury selection, how witnesses may actually be responding. Um, has there been any thought given on how we're going to deal with some of those issues? There initially, when we first started talking to the medical experts, um, we were speaking to Dr. Prince from the University of Florida and Dr. Aaron Kovitz from the University of Miami um, and Dr. Uh, 
Dr. Ratson from um, Mount Sinai here in Miami, they had initially told us that face shields were, were sufficient without masks and that we thought that we would give the juries, the lawyers and the witnesses face shields. But the science has shown that even with a face shield, because of the droplet exposure that we should be wearing masks under. Some very smart business people are actually working on see-through masks and her, perhaps by July 15th we will have those. I don't know, but if you go on Etsy, they're all over the place. I don't know how successful they will be. Um, but yes, it's gonna be odd. We've discussed, can you hear the witness? Perhaps people will have their witnesses appear by, uh, by, by conference like we do now. Some witnesses don't come into court, they, they're on a screen. Maybe that will be the way so you can see the witness. Um, the hybrid jury pilot that we put in was so that the lawyers could at least interact with the jury at some point and meet the jury and be able to speak to them without masks. And that's what the hybrid allows in jury selection. But during the trial in person, everybody, including the judge, will be wearing a mask. Um, and so our sound system in the Dade County Courthouse that we all know is going to be circa 1925 will be an interesting challenge, but we're gonna go forward and hope that it goes well. Thank you for that and thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit more broadly about some of the other issues that are going on around us today. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Soto. We understand, uh, I know uh, Al Dotson has another commitment. We appreciate both of you very much. Um, you know, I, I've been on the bench now 23 years, I think, and uh, most of it's been in the criminal side. And, you know, I've come to a very simple conclusion after all these years is that in many ways the criminal justice system is nothing more than the repository for many failed public policies. And it leads to a lot of frustration among law enforcement trying to deal with issues. Um, we have race issues. We have a lot of issues going on. And, uh, if nothing else, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to pause. Um, we've significantly emptied our jails. Um, we've uh, stopped making a lot of arrests at the moment. Uh, the state attorney has been terrific about um, dispensing of uh, low level offenses that maybe should not have come into our system to begin with and dropping charges. Um, but how do you all see this as an opportunity um, to, to rethink or re-envision um, our criminal justice system. Uh, have we overextended it? Um, you know, look at the data, um, the vast majority, probably 80 to 85 percent of people who are in jails and prisons in the United States have both serious mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and our civil system really hasn't provided the level of care and so not only do we have a huge overrepresentation of people with co of color in our criminal justice system, we have a huge overrepresentation of people with color with mental health and substance abuse issues. And, and so I'd like to get some feedback from you know, the remaining panelists who are also wonderful experts in this arena and, and see what you think about how we re-envision this and, should we re-envision and, and is there a better way than what we've been doing and how, you know, I think it was Churchill who said never waste a good crisis and, and how do we take advantage of this opportunity to, to improve and, 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 and be more just in some ways. So I'll open it to anybody who wants to address it. Steve, if I could just jump in here. Um, this is the time, this is the moment in our history where we do have to embrace this opportunity to really self-reflect as a society and as a judicial system, including the criminal justice system, and all the societal failures, as you say, that really, when those break down, they end up in the criminal justice system. I, th this has been one of the most uh, moving times in his recent history that I can remember, where everyone was in agreement on such a serious issue. And Black Lives Matters, and all these young voices and people of all colors and races are really concerned about um, the racial and ethnic disparities that they see and they feel personally. 
And so we got to take this opportunity to really take on not only that reflection and not only that self and analyze and recognize that our social intersections are not working for a lot of um, communities, especially those that are marginalized, but to really get some good concrete changes in place, you know, policies and procedures in place. And that's all of us, including my office, right? I was on a conversation with some of your colleagues recently. The, the courts are looking at this. We're all looking at this because we now need to move forward with tangible concrete changes. And so a lot of it's going to be within the profession of policing. A lot of it is going to be within the legislative arena. A lot of it's going to be in prosecutor's offices. A lot of it's going to deal with police unions. It's going to take all of us. And people have the will now. You know, so if we all move forward with one voice and we can talk Tallahassee into making some of those changes that we all know need to be made. So I, I am looking at it, although it's been a lot of pain and suffering that I've seen within my office. Um, we have a very diverse group of lawyers and support staff and it's very painful for them and it's painful for us to see, to watch, you know, George Floyd be murdered before our very eyes, tortured and then murdered. And so that reality is very painful for all of us. And if we can just turn this grief and this pain into tangible reforms and action, then all of this would have been for something worthy. Willie or Ariana, would you like to comment? Sure. Um, you know, from the now that I'm in the private sector, um, I, I will tell you, uh, Steve, that when I was at the, uh, you know, in government for 23 years, exactly what Kathy says, that this has to be a partnership. Um, and I think that if people, if, if the community stops trusting in, in public officials, in prosecutors, police officers, the system starts to crumble. And so the, the, the glue to all of this is trust. Trust that everybody that has these important positions like Kathy, Nariana, and others are using their incredible power uh, to do good, to do justice, to do it in a way that it's fair, that to do it in a way that is impartial. And, and that is the way it's being done. Now, there are, you know, um, if you look at history, I think that if you look at history in terms of racial injustice, um, I, I guess even being legally sanctioned, it wasn't until the Brown versus Board of Education that you actually had the issue of, um, you know, uh, desegregation and all that. And that was in the 1950s. So there's a lot for, I guess, us in the community to, to grapple with and to figure out how to, how to go from here. I think this is an incredible opportunity for lawyers since, you know, for us in the legal profession to rise to the challenge. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities for us to do good, whether you're in the private sector or in the government sector. I think a lot of it has to deal with whether a good friend of mine, our, our diversity um, partner at, our, at the Holland and Knight, Tiffany Lee, uh, she wrote uh, an, an opinion piece that talks about having courageous and candid discussions. Um, very, sometimes they're gonna be uncomfortable. Sometimes they're gonna be, you know, where, where you're, and it could be in an informal setting or in a formal setting. But I think we need to do that. We, we start, and, and I, you know, we've already been seeing some reforms around the, the, the country. Um, and there are a lot of things that are already starting to happen. Training programs, police departments that are talking more about being guardians and not just um, enforcers. I mean, they are, they have to enforce the law, but they can also look to it in a way that it's, that it's you know, looked upon as, as how you look at your profession. It's a noble profession. It's an important profession. It's a profession of trust. But I think that by having these, these conversations, um, over at Holland and Knight, we had a town hall with 1,300 professional staff members and lawyers chimed in. We're now having these local discussions. So in Miami office, we're having one next week. Um, that's one way of starting the conversation, listening, and not just listening, but listening and then acting, finding ways to dismantle anything that can be seen as, as not being uh, racially just. And as lawyers, working on pro bono cases, going to community, uh, finding out to volunteer on, on, on items and work like, like you're doing, Steve, and with mental health issues and, you know, and, and, and defendants. It's, get, it's 
I think this is an opportunity because with the COVID-19 um, situation and with a lot of us being home and being in our communities and being in our places, we can reach out and do a lot. Our, we're doing a lot more pro bono because if clients are pausing the billable work, our pro bono hours have increased uh, at the firm. And I think that we can focus that pro bono energy to racial injustice endeavors. Um, so that's what we're pushing our attorneys to do um, and finding out ways to, to making a difference. And I think it takes all of us in our own way. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate locally. We, uh, I think both Kathy and Willie mentioned the term, we're a very collaborative community. I don't think people appreciate uh, how collaborative South Florida, Miami-Dade particularly, really is. I, I've always found that our diversity has made us stronger in that area, uh, not weaker. Um, and we've done amazing things. I mean, uh, because of some of the work that we've done with the state attorney and the public defender, um, the number of arrests in Dade County actually fell from 118,000 to 53,000 this last year. And most of it's because of the work we've done in mental health and training of law enforcement. But there's also a very interesting component in law enforcement that I don't think we've spoken nearly about. And, and while race certainly we know does play a role, there may be a bigger role that we're ignoring that may be um, more, um, uh, is a greater causation to some of the issues that we're having. Um, after Ferguson, uh, President Obama uh, commissioned a <clears throat> study of data to look at uh, police officers using excessive force. And what they found, which was really amazing, is that most of the excessive force wasn't coming because of race. It was coming from police officers that were leaving a traumatic event prior to the call. And so what it seems to be is we know that about 20% of all law enforcement officers have very serious post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, some of them are returning vets, getting re-traumatized, and some of them are just getting traumatized on the job. There was a, a recent study, um, uh, uh, trauma is a physiological reaction in the brain. It's an overdose of what we call cortisol or cortisone. And if you get too much of it, it alters your brain activity and it makes you very reactive without thinking sometimes. And there was a study that said police officers get six to nine times more cortisol a day than we do. Um, as part of our mental health project in training our CIT officers, um, our CIT coordinator gets about 150 calls a month from police officers for their own personal mental health issues. And one of the things that we had to do is because they won't go to their departments for help, for obvious reasons, we've been able to get them treated outside their department. And as a result, our police shootings in South Florida have almost stopped. And, and I think, you know, and I'd love your comment on it, all of you, is, you know, what more can we do then if we know by looking at the data that this is a more complex issue than we realized, what steps can we take in law enforcement to make sure that there's better wellness. I mean, is there a way to work with law enforcement? So if we have an officer who's just left a very traumatic incident, take them off for the rest of the day so that they're not getting re-exposed and overreacting to a situation. But would love your comments. Pete, I think that it's funny. I, it's not funny. I mean, it's, it's, it's very relevant that you mention that because I often refer to, I don't know if the business community knows this, but what you have started and we have done together really with the, with the crisis intervention uh, training and how it has really reduced those potential flashpoints. And I think that is a prime example and with your power of knowledge that we can take that same uh, evidence, right? That's data driven to show how it works and now give that extra argument towards, we need to help our police officers cope. With, with the, what you just said, I did not know, but it makes so much sense. The other thing is two other contributing factors, I think, Steve, are that uh, they have their own difficulties with life, marriage and divorce and grief and someone dying. You know, they have all those things that they also have to deal with. And, and then last but not least, we're also asking them to do more. You know, right. social worker and come to the scene and fix what's going on in, in my house and, and mental health, you pretty much address that. So I think we need to understand 
that the majority of these men and women that are out there trying to protect us and serve us are good, but they're also human and they need better training and we, better, we need to better understand them as part of our overall humanity and equip them right. with the skills and knowledge to avoid the kind of tragedies that we see occurring. Yeah. Last year, more police officers died from suicide than in the line of duty. And you touched about the other three areas, aside from having high suicide rates, they have high substance use rates, they have high domestic violence rates, and they have high divorce rates. And it's all because of the PTSD. And, and they're in such a difficult position. And they're also in kind of a macho, you know, position that they don't want to talk about it. Um, and so they won't go to the departments for help. And I really think we need to, as a community, reach out and, and figure out a way to do better wellness among our law enforcement and to restructure our social programs so that they're not acting as a frustrated social worker who cannot resolve issues that are not resolvable because the resources aren't there. And, and all those things are contributing to some really difficult issues. Ariana, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say, um, you know, look, I think having been on national calls with all this protest and, and you know, we are 94 U.S. attorneys, I'm, you know, uh, I'm sorry, 93 U.S. attorneys or 94 offices, but one of us has double duty. But nationwide, we were on calls when all of the stuff was going on. And I have to say, our law enforcement community here, um, we had one night that was a little difficult, but after that one night, our law enforcement chiefs got together and really uh, started talking about, wait a second, how are we gonna handle this? Because we need to respect these protesters' right, their constitutional right to protest. And they really sat back together and really started to engage these protesters and people leading the protest. And they instructed the people on the front lines and the officers, let them protest. We're protecting their constitutional rights. Let's try to keep other people out. And I have to tell you something. I give a lot of credit to our chiefs um, here locally and our police officers here. I'm not saying that we were perfect. I'm not saying that we were free of all incidents. But these police officers here, when you compare it to nationwide incidents, I thought our police officers did a really great job of really protecting our, the constitutional rights that everybody had. I mean, the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement that we have seen in our nation over the last 23 days is just amazing. I mean, you have more white individuals marching than you do black and brown individuals. I mean, we are really sending a message as a country. And yes, we need to change and we, change has to come in all different forms. And we are starting little by little. And I agree with Willie, dialogue is so important. Why are we so afraid to talk about race? And why are police officers so afraid to talk about race? And why do we have this apprehension? It's like if you see a black man and a police officer, there's just immediate tension. It shouldn't be, it should be two people just having a conversation. And, you know, I've had very difficult conversations with people in my office. And I said, we're going to have this discussion. I get it's difficult. But we have to continue to have this discussion. Our police officers have to have this discussion. We need to address their mindfulness, their welfare, their attitudes. And I just think that as a police chief community, I really think Miami-Dade County is really ahead of the game. And again, we have ways to go. We are not even close to getting like to the finish line. But I really think that our community is on to something. And, you know, we were on national te uh, television because Chief Ed Hudak got a bunch of the community uh, leaders of, of chiefs of police from Sweetwater and from others and really started engaging to, uh, protesters in dialogue and answering their questions as to why police do certain things and, 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 and was kneeling on the floor with them. You know, I mean, that goes a long way. You know, we have to show empathy, you know, 
we may not have been victims of the same situation and we can't be sympathetic, but all of us can be empathetic to yeah, other people's feelings. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, Charles Dusso, the former county commissioner, had a really interesting article in the Herald and op-ed piece this week. And he was talking about some of the structural and institutional racism that went on. And he was actually talking about the GI Bill, which is something that my dad, who was a vet, um, used to buy a house and go to college on. Um, but what happened was after the federal government distributed the money to the states, less than one or two percent of African Americans were given access to the GI Bill. So they were, they were limited in, in buying a house, which is a way to wealth. They were limited to college opportunities. And then an entire generation of uh, black men were not given the same opportunity as white men, which is added to this huge economic disparity in our society. And I think it's just important for people to understand those barriers and structures that were uh, put up uh, that have made it so difficult for people to advance. And, and how do we work on some of those issues in our own professions to make sure that um, as justice leaders, as lawyers, that we insist that those kinds of barriers never happen again and, and people are actually given the kinds of opportunity they need to advance because you cannot have a just society when people have such desperate, disparate uh, opportunities because you end up in this system where uh, you have very low income people, a lot of it uh, involving people of color and it's because of a real lack of opportunity. And Steve, and that's why I think that it's very, very important when we have these conversations that we uh, listen and learn and keep in mind and never forget these, what you just mentioned, it's, this is our, I don't know, decades of institutionalized uh, discrimination that has, has creeped in, in in different facets in different ways and even though you know we might not have suffered exactly like that um, we need to open our minds and our hearts and listen and then after listening and understanding taking action uh, and I think that what police chief you know Ed, Ed, Eddie Hudak did is a is a it's a wonderful sign of you know what we're gonna change the way that we engage Yep. And instead of just, you know, going at you or whatnot, we're going to kneel with you. We're going to hold hands with you. We're going to be part of the discussion with you. And I thought that was a beautiful example. I agree with that. Yeah, and I saw that as well. Um, so, but, but we have to always be mindful of the history yeah. and, and, and not just say, oh, this is just one incident or what. It, it, it's something that has been happening for way too long. And I hope to God that this is an opportunity now that we're gonna see some changes, some real concrete changes. I, I agree with everything that everybody has said and a, a lot of the structural injustices, Steve, that you were talking about, these are vestiges that we have to, moving forward, overcome. And I could not echo better what both of my friends and colleagues, Willie and Ariana, have said, that at this level, at our local community level, our police were incredibly restrained and I thought that they engaged really well. And I know because I got most of the cases or didn't get a lot of the cases as it could have been. And uh, some, of those, some of those potential flashpoints up on uh, 95 and other places that could have occurred, uh, it didn't. And it may have been exactly because from the very beginning, Ed Hudak, Ed Hudak and Jr., Danny Jr., the, you know, the president of the Bay Chiefs, they said, We're, we get you. We want to talk to you. We want this dialogue. We are empathetic. Talk to us. Explain to us. And, you know, a lot of that has to occur. But it's so, it's so forceful right now, the desire to get concrete changes, that while we're dialoguing and listening, and that's good because we're learning. I never knew that, for instance, about the GI Bill. And, um, but we can't spend too much time just talking. We really have to move towards concrete. And it doesn't all have to be done right away. There could be phases and staggered reforms, but they have to be real and they have to be tangible. They have to be, like Willie said, trusted. They have to be trusted reforms. You know, and, and you know, it's the kind of reforms that we're already doing. Um, we have the largest trained squad of what are called CIT, which is Crisis Intervention Team Police Officers in the United States. We have over 7,500 officers now trained at all 36 departments. 
and it's really helped them cope with these issues. Um, you know, we keep data on the city of Miami and Miami-Dade, um, and those two departments over the last eight years did uh, almost over 92,000 mental health calls and only made 152 arrests. Yeah. And, you know, that's the kind of trust that the community is going to be able to hold on to um, in times like this that we have to try to replicate in other places. So I want to uh, thank the three of you and the other, uh, uh, Judge Soto and Al Dotson, who had to uh, sign off a little earlier, um, as well as the chamber again for putting on this really wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Um, if, if you'd like, uh, we've got about a minute. So if anybody wants to have a closing comment, I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to do it. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Alfred, and, and I cannot thank you all from the bottom of my heart for, I know how busy everybody that participated really is, and your willingness to give back, as always, uh, means a lot to all of us. So thank you very, very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Very much so. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Good job. Thank you, Alfred. I'll turn it back right. to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to all of our panels. Uh, that was a, an extremely important discussion, especially at the end there. Uh, uh, I think we're all wrestling with that and I think it's, uh, it's extremely important that while the conversation feels, really does feel different. I mean, uh, uh, I've, I've, I mean, my, my parents were involved in the, in the civil rights movement professionally in, in, in the 60s. The conversation feels different, but it can't, you gotta move away from conversation into action. I think everybody's um, echoing that. So thank you for that. Uh, listen, this is uh, another Chamber Thursday Roundup for the week. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for participating. I hope uh, you found the conversation as enlightening as I did. Uh, we did cover uh, the PPP and the uh, uh, CARES Act uh, in, in our discussion. And I really want to take a second to harp on that because many of our members have taken uh, advantage of the PPP funding that has come out. And I want to really call to your attention that um, it, it is a little bit more complica complex when you're applying to the forgiveness part than uh, might seem at first blush. So you need to pay attention to it now. Pay close attention. Start your documentation now. Don't wait until the end when you're ready to uh, ask for the uh, loan forgiveness part. Um, because you, you might be caught behind the, the curve uh, on that one. If you do need assistance, I wanted to let you know that the chamber has opened up a, a line of service called uh, GMCC Cares. And I'm gonna ask the staff working behind the scenes if they can drop the link to that. Uh, we really have used our staff to, and trained them in helping our small businesses uh, answer all the questions that uh, come up and even hands-on in the application process. And we, ex we expect to do the same thing for the loan forgiveness process. So if you find yourself in need of assistance or asking questions, need a question answered, please contact us because our chamber is here for you. Again, thank you to all of our uh, panelists. Thank you, Judge Leifman, for uh, what is always a great discussion with you, and thank you for the work that you are doing in the mental health arena. Thank you again for all of our participants for listening. We'll see you next week at another Chamber Thursday Roundtable. Thank you, Alfred. Thanks, Al. Have a great day.